Based on the amazing feedback I got from my last video and the likes and comments I got on that video, I decided to do another set of the trick questions that you're likely to face on the GRE. The concepts tested could also come up, of course, on the GMAT and on many other tests. I recommend, as I did in the previous video, that you pause the video and try the questions yourself and see whether you get them right before you hear my explanation. It's much harder to spot a trick yourself than it is to listen to me and say, ah, oh, yeah, I would have seen that. As with the previous video, which I strongly urge you to check out if you haven't seen, all of these kind of tricks do regularly occur on the exam. So without further ado, let's get to this question. These questions, by the way, I would say are a medium to hard level. X squared is an integer. Which of the following must be integers? Tick all but apply. So I know some of you have paused and others of you are now waiting for my explanation. The trap here is to think that x must be an integer. You're trying every single number you can think of. You're trying negative two, you're trying two, you're trying zero, all different types of integers. And when you square it, it's always an integer. So you're probably saying to yourself, damn it, x must be an integer. It doesn't work for decimals and negatives are still integers, so x must be an integer. So you'd have ticked the first box, for example, and the second box and the third box based on the fact that x is an integer. And most of you would therefore not have picked the fourth and fifth box on the basis that x could be two, for example, and one over two is not an integer, or x could be three and three over two is not an integer. And that would be correct. D and E, those two boxes, are not correct. The trick here, that those students would have missed is that x could be a root. In America, I think that's called radical. But either way, x could be a square root. For example, x could be root 2, the square root of 2. If x was the square root of 2, the square root of 2 squared is still an integer. Think about it. If x was the square root of 2 or the square root of 3, when you square it, that removes the root and that equals an integer. But x itself, root two or root three, is not an integer. The square root of two is not an integer. So a, the first box, is also not necessarily an integer. So that's not the correct answer. And furthermore, if x was a root or a radical, like square root two or square root three, the second box would also be one. Think about it. If x is square root two, the square root of two cubed is root two times root two times root two. Root two times root two is two, and two times root two is just two root two, which is not an integer. You can try it, of course, on the calculator if you don't believe me. Either way, with that possibility that x is a radical or a root, like root two or root three, we can actually say that the first two, a and b, along with d and e, aren't necessarily integers. C, however, will always be an integer. Even if x is a root, like root two, when you raise it to the power of four, that will be an integer. There are many ways to verify that. You could verify that on the calculator, or you could notice that x to the power of four would be a root times itself four times. Root two times root two times root two times root two. The two pairs of root twos would become twos, and two times two is four. Or you could think of root two as two to the power of a half. And when you have two to the power of a half in brackets, power of four, the exponents multiply to get x squared, which would be an integer again. Many different ways of verifying it, but c will always be an integer no matter what number you choose. But that was just the first trick question. Did you spot that x could be a root? If not, lesson learned. Let's move on to the next trick question. Trick question number two. Square root of nine is x and x squared is nine. Y equals 20 minus 11 times two plus 12 over three. Which is bigger, x or y? Again, pause the video if you feel like you want to try these questions before I tell you the trick. I know many of you do that and I encourage that. By the way, I just thought of an amazing prank. I could just give you like a really simple question that's actually really simple with no trick. And then those students who pause the video will be thinking for like 20 minutes, where's the trick, where's the trick? And there wouldn't be a trick, but that'd be harsh, that'd be cruel. So I won't do that today. 
Today, there is going to be a trick in each question. What did you get? Well, let's go through the wrong way of doing it. You would look at the first statement about x and see that x is the square root of 9, which you would think is 3 or minus 3. Or even if you didn't think about 3 or minus 3, you would look at x squared equals 9 and say x could be 3 or minus 3. You would then calculate the value of y. By the way, you have to do the multiplication first. So 11 times 2 is 22. 20 take away 22 is minus 2. And 12 over 3 is 4. Minus 2 plus 4 is 2. And then those people who fell for the trap would then say, OK, got to be D. Plus Philip always makes it D, so it's going to be D. Y, we know for sure, is 2, whereas X could be 3 or minus 3, making the answer D. And you're probably a little bit proud of yourself because you think, I remember that X could be plus or minus when it's X squared equals 9. The problem is, I unfortunately have to tell you, that that first bit of the statement, square root 9 equals X, that doesn't have two possibilities. When you see x squared equals 9, I agree totally. That has two possibilities. You have to remember that x could be 3 or minus 3. If you see x squared equals 9, you've got to think positive or negative. But that's not true if you see the square root symbol. If you see that square root symbol on the GRE or GMAT and many other tests, the test makers mean the positive root of. You could think of that symbol as meaning the positive root of 9 in this case. Not the positive or negative root, simply the positive root of. So if x is the positive root of 9, we know for sure that x is 3. And we already know, of course, if x is 3, then x squared is 9. We know from the first equation, square root 9 equals x, that x is exclusively, specifically 3, not minus 3 because of that square root symbol. And if x is 3 for sure, not minus 3, and y is 2, we know that x is bigger than y, so quantity a is bigger. Of course, there's going to be some happy students watching this who didn't think about the negatives at all, even with x squared, and just thought x squared is 9, so x is 3. But those students have got two lessons. It could be a negative in x squared equals 9. x could be 3 or minus 3. But the extra fancy lesson is it's not the negative simply because of that square root symbol in the first equation. Square root symbol, if you see that on the page, it means the positive root. So square root symbol 9 equals 3 and only 3. So quantity A is bigger. 3 is bigger than 2. And now for my final trick. Arguably this is a slightly harder one, but either way, some people will find it hard, other people won't. So x and y are non-negative even integers x is prime, quantity a is x to the power of y, quantity b is y to the power of xy. The question looks really hard, but the underlying trick here is relatively simple. That word, non-negative, which comes up in the GRE and GMAT, means not negative. That's kind of obvious, I guess, but it also means including zero. Zero is not negative. So non-negative doesn't mean the same as positive. Let me be clear. Zero is not positive. So if they talked about positive even integers, it would start at two. But non-negative just means not including the negative numbers. So zero is part of the party. I hope that's clear. If they say non-negative, you can include zero. And furthermore, the second part of this trick, zero is even. Zero counts as an even number. So zero is a non-negative even integer. And many people would have missed that. And that's the main part of the trick. A further part of the trick is to know that if x is prime, x would have to be 2. 2 is the only even prime number, so we know for sure x is 2. The trap here, of course, is to think that y has to be 2 or 4 or 6, in which case quantity b is always bigger. 2 to the power of 2, that's quantity a, is definitely smaller than 2 to the power of 2 times 2, 2 to the power of 4. Or if y was a 4, 2 to the power of 4 is definitely smaller than 4 to the power of 2 times 4. So in almost all examples, quantity b is bigger. Remember, we know for sure that x is 2 because x is a prime even number and there's only one of those, which is 2. But most people here would pick quantity b, not thinking about 0. 
And remember, 0 is a non-negative even integer. If y was 0, then actually notice what happens with the quantities. Quantity a becomes 2 to the power of 0, which is what? Can you tell me? Many people get this wrong. 2 to the power of 0 is 1. Not 0, not 2. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. If you didn't know that, write that down. Anyway, quantity a, 2 to the power of 0 in this example, would be 1. Quantity b would be 0 to the power of 2 times 0. And if you type 0 to the power of 0 into a calculator, or try and look it up, there is no defined answer. Some mathematicians define it as 1, others define it as 0, others define it as undefined. But in all of those possibilities, notice that it's not larger than quantity a. If we define 0 to the power of 0 as 1, it's the same as quantity a. If we define it as 0, it's less than quantity a. And if we define it as undefined, then we don't know. In all three possibilities, no matter what you think about 0 to the power of 0, it's definitely not bigger than quantity a. Meaning that the answer is actually d because of that one exception of 0 being a non-negative even integer. Pat yourself on the back, of course, if you saw through all three tricks. And indeed, there's some students who maybe have seen through every trick in this video series so far. But if this video gets enough response, feedback, likes, comments, I will definitely consider doing more such trick questions in the future. This does take me a while to think about the questions, create the questions from scratch, and of course, design and edit the explanation. But I'll do it for my amazing students. See you in the next video.